Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Anne Marie Murphy. I am a uh, professor at Seton Hall University School of Diplomacy, but more important for today's event, I'm a senior research scholar here at Weatherhead and a founding partner of the New York Southeast Asian Network, both of which are sponsoring this important talk titled The 2003 Thai Elections and the Return of the Princes with one of Thailand's most noted authors and activists. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Pawin Chachavanpong Pan. <laughs> 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. We were practicing. Um, who is an associate professor uh, at the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at the University of Kyoto in Japan. He is the chief editor of the online journal Kyoto Review of Southeast Asian Studies, and he is the author and editor of many important books on Thai politics and foreign policy, and his forthcoming book as editor, Rama X, the Thai Monarchy under King, King Wachi Ralongkorn, um, has already been banned, um, yeah. even before it's published thank you, thank you, the Thai by... <laughs> by the Yale Southeast Asia program. So we can all be on the lookout for that um, later this winter. So without any further ado, it is my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Colin. Thank you, Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. So it's good to come back to, uh, to Colombia, I think exactly a year. Uh, and uh, New York has been very busy this week uh, with a lot of you know, big names coming, coming into the town an old name coming in the, into the, emerging in the scene as well. So we're talking about Thai Prime Minister being here for the UN, who just gave terrible speech. Uh, then uh, I have exhibition at Columbia, uh, started on Monday, and then uh, we have a distinguished guest coming, uh, Kun Uh That also is another, another in, interesting development, not, not, such a, not such a in New York, but also, uh, with reper repercussion, you know, on Thai politics. I will talk about that toward the end. Uh, but uh, the focus of this talk, basically, to look at the uh, Thailand after the elections and toward the end, you know, I just want to make it sort of, you know, more entertaining by putting the return of the princes to, to make it sound like, you know, Hollywood film. Uh, but, I mean, their return, just like Hollywood film. Uh, let me start, you know, very quickly uh, before going into the election of uh, this year in May in order to provide sort of, you know, important context uh, of uh, politics, you know, in the pre-election. So I just go, you know, sort of bullet point. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, the pre-election, uh, of 2023, you know, we have sort of two big events. One is the, the coup of 2014, as we know, overthrowing the elected government of Ying Lak, uh, and then also put Ying Lak in exile. And I got a feeling that I got a feeling that Ying Lak will be coming home very soon too. Uh, that is one thing. Then from 2014, uh, it was the death of King Pui in 2016. And I have to say that that's sort of a big uh, turning point in Thai politics, you know, when we look at uh, the most authoritative brand, you know, in Thai politics that has lasted for 70 years and suddenly, you know, came to an end in 2016, suddenly sort of put Thailand into an unknown waters. And I, I like to believe that Thailand is still in the unknown waters. Yep. Uh, and... Linking up the two events, and I also believe, and I think I argue elsewhere that the coup of 2014 was sort of, you know, uh, a, a kind of preparation for the royal transition to make sure that uh, the transition would go very smoothly. And indeed, it did go quite smoothly, you know, when the military government of Prayut sort of took charge of the succession. Uh, at the same time, you know, uh, the elite planning for their entrenchment of power and this time they, uh, they did it through the re rewriting of the constitution and we know that one of the key elements of the current uh, constitution has been to set up the senate where all members are appointed and the junta is the one who appointed you know all uh, of the all of the senate and again i like to believe that uh, it was because of the work of the senate that that uh 
uh, bring Thailand up to this point, you know, and then this basically disregard uh, the result of the previous election. Okay, after the um, the death of King King Pumipon and the crowning of King Wajalongon, uh, it's time for the election in 2019. Mm. This time, I think uh, the elite, you know, apart from putting the infrastructure within the constitution so that they could, you know, uh, continue to entrench itself in politics, there might, there might, there might be an, an attempt for uh, military elite, you know, to strip their uniform and for once invested in electoral politics uh, in the name of Palang Pacharat. And we knew that eventually Payut, you know, came back as prime minister. Uh, but that again did not deny the fact that the real winning for the 2019 election was still Pure Thai Party, right? So up to 2019, Pure Thai has been the only party that has won every election from 2001, five, then 11, right? Then again, uh, 19, uh, except 2023. So uh, I think the reason I, I, I want to emphasize here is that so up to 2019, <clears throat> Pure Thai had been number one enemy for the elite. But again, it's different story now in 2023, right? When some other party, someone else, you know, replacing uh, the Pure Thai. 2019, the election, uh, the Pure Thai was unable to form the government. Uh, giving the opportunity for the elite parties to form uh, the Prayut administration, which, which lasted until uh, 2000, uh, 2023. During this period, again, there's two important things uh, happening with the dissolution of the Future Ford Party. I must emphasize the Future Ford Party here uh, because this had been uh, an alternative in Thai politics. You know, uh, Just when you think that the Pure Thai had been uh, the representation of pro-democracy faction, uh, but it has been very inconsistent on the part of the Pure Thai. And, uh, and it, it became even more evident in 2023 that I think this day we can no longer categorize the Pure Thai as sort of pro-democracy. You can simply put them as conservative. Then I think that is the direction, direction of the Pure Thai uh, to go, right? But, but Future Food is just something very, very, very unusual and very different. Uh, just enough to say that you know the the birth of this party sort of you know uh uh frighten or maybe uh intimidate you know people in the palace because it came at the same time as the emergence of the youth led uh protest in 2020 so if you see the timeline the this dissolution sort of in february and then in june by june then you have a big protest this protest is just something i'm so excited about because it is is the first time uh, when uh, the, the the controversial issue of monarchy has been made uh, as a public agenda and it is something that i like to believe it uh, is a process that is irreversible so there is nothing that you can reverse it by now even though you know despite uh, the uh, the less majestic law you can talk about the monarchy so openly this day. So, and that really thanks to uh, youth movement in 2020, 2021. So, I'm, I mean, this chain of, you know, action sort of giving, you know, uh, the new and even more deep concern for the elite, because this time you are not dealing just red shirt and, and, and Thaksin, because under red shirt and Thaksin, you know, the, uh, that sentiment of anti-monarchy sort of really shallow, you know, uh, nothing really deep rooted, but I think this time from 2020, you started to see that the the, the wish of the young uh, for royal reform went much deeper than the call from the red shirt. You know, uh, yesteryear. Summary for this part, right? So, I mean, up up to let's say uh, the 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 protest, uh, you started to see the continued vicious circle with the competition between non elective institution. Uh, com competing for power with elective constitution. In other words, you know, the palace, the military continue to fight with, you know, those uh, who, uh, you know, uh, go into uh, run in the election. Then you talk about the coup as well. Uh, also, another thing, emergence of uh, an alternative political party in the name of Future Food Party. Munaki had remained at the crux of the problem in Thailand, right? So, I mean, if, if you look at the 2020, the dissolution of the party basically 
because of the party became such a threat to the palace and also uh, the protest you know that demanded immediate reform of the monarchy so you can't help but have to put uh, the monarchy right at the center of the Thai conflict and last one is basically the protest you know during these two years 20 and 21 now this provided an important uh, context for the election of 2023 i think uh, the crackdown on on the youth in 2021 came in two forms uh, one is of course, physical a uh, crackdown. You know, every time they went on the street, they were cracked down. And I think the Thai state now they know sophisticated way to deal with them, uh, to make sure that you know these people would be cracked down, but yet just enough not to be condemned by international community. So they basically take all the boxes, yeah. So you use tear gas, you use rubber bullet, we use you know contain medicine that to block them. So to ensure that there would be no high score of death or casualties. So that's why, you know, the government can continue uh, to crack down on, on the student. And on top of that, you know, they use less majestic law to arrest all the key members. So that's why uh, you start to see the sort of uh, the, the, the movement fading away. And it, would, it did not help, you know, when the less majestic returned uh, by, I think, the end of 2020. The king, you know, asked for the morator moratorium uh, in 2017. So from 2017, there had been no cases of less majeste, but because of the of the street protest, then it came back. And when it came back this time, oh my God, it just go up and up and up. Not just only the number of cases, just basically off the roof. Uh, the number of people, the age, you know, of the people who have been charged getting lower and lower and lower. We're talking about the youngest. Uh, in the case of Yok, she was charged when she was 14, right? Uh, so, uh, now that that as i said that, that was quite important context for the election of 2023 the result okay uh to my surprise uh the now the uh, the move forward party right uh future forward then move forward i think they started to, to think about new name in case you know the current party would be dissolved again so uh i would never imagine that that the party would be would win a lot i think they would win to a certain extent, uh, especially, you know, when Thaksin talking so much about, you know, this election uh, from Dubai, even, you know, participating in a weekly talk through Clubhouse uh, under the name of Tony Woodsum. So, you know, they went all out, you know, calling for landslide for Phuer Thai. So I thought that maybe Thaksin tried to use, you know, all the weapon that he had this time to ensure that the party would, you know, would remain on top, just like any other election in the past. And I think in his in Thaksin's mind, you know, to win a landslide e election, that could be, that could increase his bargaining power, you know, when it comes to him uh, wanting to come home, right? And, and he always talking about coming home throughout the one-year the one year period leading up to the election. But at the same time, he made some, you know, controversial statements uh, condemning, you know, the kid on the street and also talking about less majestic law as, you know, there is... There is no problem with the law. He says something like that. I will go into detail a bit later. But just enough to say that, uh, you know, the winning of the Mufford party came as a surprise to me because I thought that maybe Puerto Thai would win more. Uh, at the end, uh, out of 500, uh, oh my God, I just totally forgot. <laughs> yeah, the, the coronation of the king, uh, dissol dissolution of the Mufford party, the election. Okay, sorry, it's a bit too small. But if you can see here, 500, yeah, right. Uh, the move forward, one, uh, one, one, five, one, Thai, 141. So becoming the two uh, leading winning parties. Again, to everyone, my, especially on the pro-democracy side, oh my God, this is a, a celebration. It could not be a better news, right? When the two big important party, you know, uh, like, uh, like were likely to join hand. Right. And if they could join hand, then they would make the, the government sort of quite strong. You're talking about two main party coalition, right? Instead of smaller party coming as a coalition, that usually gives a kind of you no know, instability. Uh, but again, again, it's it's not the case. Uh Peter at the beginning was tipped to become prime minister, but soon, you know, his wish was uh shoot down because of the allegation uh, that he has remained, uh, he had remained uh, his chair in a defunct media company. But by now, everyone know that, you know, this has long been a plot once again 
in order to try to disqualify a uh, pita right and at the same time you know to try to uh to cut the chance of the party you know to be a lead to to be a leading uh entity to form the government so soon that you know um a number of prominent uh senator came out uh, to say that they would not support uh uh the move for party given pita's you know outstanding uh allegation and also they use this less majesty law as a key condition for the future government of thailand by saying that exactly because of the move for party proposed the reform of article 112 this should not be allowed because now this could be interpreted as overthrowing the system of monarchy of constitutional monarchy okay something like that now that is that is a new that is, that is a new development in Thailand, which I started to fear. I started to fear because from that moment, two months ago, and as to, I think, last night or this morning, when Chaw has been disqualified for life, exactly because, you know, she said something, she referred something to the king. Now, she said something to refer to, to the king, that is less majeste. Less majeste can disqualify you, you know, your political career, can also disqualify any political party. It has become the new benchmark to set a standard, you know, for Thai politics. So uh, this is really a negative development in Thailand. So as expected, Pita was sort of being uh, put, you know, put aside. And I do not want to repeat it, but just enough to say that during this moment, I think the poor Thai uh, sort of, you know, it, it's just so timely, you know, I sometimes I just could not could not believe, you know, a lot of things that happen in Thai politics. It's just too good to be true. It's just so surreal. It's just movie like, you know, it's just at the right time that Taksin, the plane of Taksin, has to land in Bangkok. But but this is, you know, I mean, a, 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 a comparison is not that like verbatim or per se. What I'm trying to say is that the timing for the poor Thai, you know, in order to, to bring back Taksin, it's just so perfect. It's just, it's just so perfect that during the time, during this time, that uh, the number one party you now become number one enemy. So that's all, as I said, that sort of put, sort of, you know, put uh, the, the, the burden out of the shoulder of the poor Thai and, and, and Taksin. And in so doing, Taksin was so quick to make a deal with the devil. And, you know, uh, I have to use this term when now talking about devil, better the devil, you know. Right, Taksin is the better the devil, you know, for the palace. So they know inside out, outside in about Taksin, they know that Taksin was so desperate to make any kind of deal so that, you know, he could come home, he could have all the things back, you know, in terms of, you know, his uh, polit political, uh, if not, if not political career, uh, his political influence, you know, not talking about uh, his businesses. And then uh, so that he could reunite with his family as well. So as I said, it's just so timely for him. But it come with a heavy price as well. It come as a heavy price because I can anticipate that, you know, poor Thai would have a lot of problem uh, in the next election. But this might not be a matter of concern for, for Thaksin and poor Thai because as we see uh, the result of the election and, and the forming of the government, what really, what really determine the government no longer the voters, but it's people up there. So if Taksin, you know, would shift the strategy as in the past, relying so much on popular support, now he, he can have the elite support. And then maybe he doesn't have to care so much about popular support. So that might also be the way to go. So that's why I'm not saying that this could be the end of the day for poor time, right? It could allow Poor Thai to, to, to go on, to continue, but basically just by shifting alliance in this case. So, and the rest we see that at the end, uh, Poor Thai, you know, working with all of the conservative political party who work together to gang up against uh, the Mufford party and all, you know, got the blessing from the palace. Uh, okay, I'll end this part, yeah, on the, on the election by saying that there also something very interesting coming out of the election. Apart from, you know, uh, high war turnout, 75%, you know, almost among the highest in the world. So that goes to show, you know, the level of uh, 
political political consciousness among the Thais, shifting voting pattern, uh, especially how the moving 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 forward party basically it's just one almost every constituency once occupied by the pure Thai party. So if you look at the map or map of Thailand in the past, you could see red. This there you see yellow, and it it is now the color that the palace you know fear the most is the orange, right? So uh, not only that, the 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 move for party managed to win even in certain con constituency occupied by by armies. So this is something that is just so unprecedented. So we are we talking about moles in the army or some kind of fragmentation within the army? Also some in the South as well, that used to be the territory of the Democrat Party. Again, what is for the, the orange? Obstacle, obstacle this time, you know, after the, the election uh, and in the process of forming the government, we know the Senate, I will not repeat it. Uh, and then that could become, uh, that could be a work of constitutional court. I think they are waiting to, to eliminate Pita. So it's, it's a matter of time, including the dissolution of the party. The coup could also be an option, even though I think it is unlikely at this point, because I think they found yet again another sophisticated way to deal with their enemy uh, in, in, in a legitimate context. And when I said in a legitimate context, it's basically not only using the hand of the, of the Senate, which basically, you know, legal or constitutional, even though we don't like it, but it's constitutional. The other thing is that I think the palace tried to co-opt with different conservative political parties in order to work together. And they just basically speak, you know, with like one voice, like this is it, you know, definitely we will not work with the move for party. So, I mean, there's no way that, that the move for party could form a government because no one want to, you know, jump into the same ship of the move for party. So I think for me, this sort of, you know, show a kind of a very sophisticated way instead of, you know, using blunt tools of, <clears throat> of the coup in the past, they can just use, you know, uh, instrument within uh, the parliamentary, you know, framework. Why the move for party one? I think because of the changing of the of the political land landscape, right? Okay. Uh, it, it is amazing to see the, this party who was disbanded in 2020, but after three years, sort of, you know, uh, when it fell, you know, it sort of rose up and this time it came so strongly to become the winner. I think exactly because the party presents something that that I think the younger generation right have wanted some that they, they, they propose fundamental change. I think this is a key word. This thing, you know, that that had not been mentioned by the Pure Thai Party. Pure, Pure Thai Party continue to rely on same old strategy of you know uh, better livelihood you know bed and bread bed and uh, bread and butter this and that but when it comes to something uh, that would sort of emphasize you know ideology principle you know something that again would lead to fund fundamental change it has been uh, the the move for party has been the only party that offer that thing and that's why you know it has become popular among uh, the, the young i would say first time and second time voters and again first time and second time voter, voters they, uh, they're old enough to vote, but yet they're also young enough not to have toxin in their memory. And I think that's very important. You know, people talk so much about the peak of toxin, the success of Thai Rak Thai, the 30 baht, you know, you, you know, so healthcare. I'm so bored, with, you know, it's just like God saying, come on. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, these people, these people that grew up during which time that toxin was or in exile. So, I mean, they have no recollection. But then when it's time of their voting, then they look at the party that they like. And then I think the Mufer party, you know, was that party for them. Okay, one is because of the progressive agenda. Second, monarchy still, still matter that much. And exactly also because of the, of the Mufer party that came out with the reform of the Article 112, 112 which allied with uh, the demand of the youth in the in the in the protest, so I think two two of them, you know, sort of you know go hand in hand with the monarchy, sort of becoming uh, the the driving force for them to come together and to try to move Thailand forward in order to to handle or to deal with the monarchy issue. The third one is fading popularity of Thaksin, right? Even though Thaksin coming home, uh, 
well, we have we have, we see we have heard so little of Thaksin. Someone told me that he started to regret that he thought he would be, you know, in this beautiful hospital or prison for a few days. Then they will they'll let him go. But there has been no sign that, you know, Thaksin would be let go. Apart from that, you know, he got royal pardon from eight years to one year. So again, there could be a possibility of Thaksin being uh, in confinement for up to one year. This, I mean, he must, he must have been so frustrated. And, but, but that also can be a good reason why Thaksin could remain there for a year, you know, as a kind of hostage, you know, so that Pur Thai could do what Pur Thai is supposed to do, you know, in order, in order to serve, you know, the interests of the palace. Uh, but apart from that, you know, uh, you know, the, the fading popular, popular, popularity of Thaksin, it has to come anyway. You know, you have been away from, from politics for almost two decades. You have done almost nothing, you know, apart from uh, doing sort of this uh, show uh, weekly. And then, uh, and also exactly because of, of the mindset of Thaksin has never changed. Everything else for Thaksin has changed. In term, you know, I talked to him, you know, lately. If you, if you ask him about, you know, he, he caught, uh, education policy, economic policy, oh my God, Thaksin can say, it, can just, you know, can give you lecture. You know, he has been very sharp. But then when you come to sort of something very important for Thai politics this day, human right issue, democracy, how you're going to deal with, you know, the old power, Thaksin couldn't go anywhere. He got stuck. And I think, I don't, I don't think this, you know, were represented, you know, in the eye of the, of the young. And the last one is basically youth support for the Mufford party. Next one is uh, changing political landscape is a, uh, the role of the youth today. Why they become so important? Why are they so different from the previous generation? I would like to think that uh, there might be two reasons. One is, uh, again, when I talk about them growing, grew, grew up during which time, Thaksin sort of out of politics. They also grew up during which time, uh, Pumipon also out of politics, right? Pumipon was hospitalized in 2019. He never came out. And then from 2019, you started to see the decline of the royal hegemony. And with that, also the decline of propaganda. So unlike my generation, that you have to watch, you know, royal news every 8 p.m., you know, going into the cinema, this and that, as you know, then everything is in textbook. And you don't have the second, the second uh, fact, factor that I would say is social media, right? But I say it now. And because I did not have so much social media during my time, the information I got regarding politics and, and the palace only came from the state. And it's one way, and it's top down. You can't argue against it. You can't get anything official until, until the state said it's official, right? So that's why everything remains sort of gossip and then rumor, uh, you know, from behind the scene. But this, they think very different. So because they could escape long year of, of, of I think, royal propaganda. So I, I think that's why. They do not. They do not ha have any sort of burden on their shoulder. So I think it would be easier for them to deal with difficult issues like the monarchy, because they did not have to go through, you know, the bans and everything. You know, the reverence of the king, this and that. So again, unlike unlike my generation, even a lot of my colleagues, you know, sort of same age range, even even if they have become Taswang today, meaning enlightened yeah but they still have a kind of sort of they have to restrain themselves they say Pawin, you know i understand you do you know great job but i can't say it. i still have my family my wife saying this my mom saying this you know i can't get out of it but i'm with you yeah but the kid can just go out there right another point is the social media so it's just basically open up all the possibilities uh, especially when it comes to getting information challenging you know a uh, state opinion state nar narrative on all things about politics about the monarchy this kid can learn what happened elsewhere they can learn from multi alliance they can learn what happened in what kind of you know the failure of the united states right so uh <clears throat> They have this sort of new concept of legitimacy, of uh, political power, of transparency and accountability. And I think they would like it. They would like to see it, you know, from key institutions in Thailand, including the monarchy. And that's why I think this drove them to come up with the, the, 10, the 10 demand. Okay, last five minutes. Uh, let's respond this from the elite. 
uh, when it comes to the changing uh, political landscape. Okay, basically they, they do they do what they, they are doing, what they are doing, right? First thing is to ensure that, you know, if they could not control the result of, of the election, they have to be they have to be sure that they, they at least can control uh what who would come next in in politics. And I think this time with uh, what I said with the tools that they have, the so sophisticated so sophisticated way that they, they have been doing, I think they have been very successful. So they are using, you know, mixing both old and new uh, approaches in dealing with threat. And including one of them is another approach of re reconciling with toxin. There's so much so to talk about reconciliation between the pilots and toxin. I leave it uh, for Q&A. Uh, I will not talk about will from the outside world. Again, I leave it for the Q&A, especially, you know, what, uh, what would be the response from United States, you know, from a Western government. Uh, what about, you know, a neighboring country in Thailand? The rise of illiberalism, you know, in the region with what happened in Cambodia, you know, what happened in Burma, you know, did not really help the Thai situation, you know. And, and I think it's sort of, you know, this country sort of gave moral support for the Thai elite to continue doing what they're doing. Right, because they think that they are in, in sort of warm, embrace arms, you know, of like minded autocrats in the region. Last, the prince, my new friend. Uh, I can't say so much so, but I still cannot say a lot. Otherwise, he will stop talking to me. What I can say though, that, uh, he came to my ex. Okay. Understand. Okay. My relationship with him. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Understand. Okay. Second son of uh, Washington <clears throat> has been outcast, you know, for more than 27 years uh, because the king divorced his wife and they all escaped to, they were in England. But then when the divorce came, uh, the king sort of, you know, brought home the youngest daughter, who now be who now has become Princess uh, Silwan Wali. The rest of the family, four boys, and then the mother, eventually migrated to the United States, and they settled in Florida. So they sort of grew up by themselves. The second one was the most prominent and the most active. I think, uh, because his own because of his own characteristic, anyway. And uh, in fact, he lived in New York. Uh, he practiced law here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I, I have to give credit to the mother, you know, single mother, and then raised her own children, and everyone sort of, you know, successful in their own career. Uh, it's happened that the, the, the eldest, the eldest uh, brother, you know, who sort of, if you put aside the issue of being outcast, you know, best definitely have to stand, you know, at the front line of the succession. But it's happened that, you know, he's no longer interested in Thai politics. Good for him. And... <laughs> And he got married with with American woman, and the and the wife said, "Don't mess up with Thai politics." So that's why you know they went away to doing some you know farm work, uh, in Ohio or this and that. That gave the chance to watch this on the second one. And as I said, it's happened that he also has been very active, active in a sense that you know he has been going out and about within the United States, meeting with Thai communities, this and that. You know, and in some cities they still they still offer him royal treatment meaning that, you know, prostration in front of him, uh, which he, he said that he tried to stop them from doing it. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, and then he also sort of wanting to, to get gradually into politics, you know, but from the outside, you know, he set up sort of, you know, foundation, uh, a kind of charity work in order to help Thai students, again, based in New York, in New York. And uh, many years ago, I, I even helped him, you know, promoting this kind of foundation. But I must, I'm, I, I'm, I would have thought that, you know, the, the, re, uh, the fact that he went home in early August, you know, it was, not, it was not something too immediate or too sudden, right? But at the same time, I don't think this had long been plotted. I think it just happened exactly because of the, the eldest daughter, you know, uh, fell sick in December last year. And, and even though she has never been officially announced as the next heir to the throne, but, you know, people, Thai people seem to know that, you know, she would be the one because out of the three 
uh, I have to use this word, it might not be correct word, legitimate children of the king, right? Three of them, three of the legitimate. One is uh, Ong Pa right now in coma, yeah? And the second one is the, the fashionista, yeah? The second one, and the last one, Tipangon, the boy, the, the prince, uh, all have their own complex background that, you know, if we still live, you know, under King Watch, King King Pumipon, they would have been disqualified immediately because of their own complex story. For example, you know, they have some sort of health issue, which, you know, we can't even allow to talk about it. But the issue of their mother, you know, one, you know, being refugee in the United States, one even still in house arrest. How could we, how could we have the next sovereign of Thailand whose mother is a refugee in the United States? Can you imagine? I can't, right? Including the one also in house arrest. So, I mean, that's why, you know, even among the three available le legitimate choices, these are no good. That's why I think that, you know, uh, there would be some sort of uh, progressive, you know, you know, maybe less conservative, that way, that word better, less conservative, conservative faction within the palace thought about what they on. Yep, that maybe bringing him home could provide an alternative to the royal succession. Instead of right now, you know, we really have nowhere to go because the eldest daughter, you know, I got a feeling that the announcement would come soon, right? So once the announcement come, then the next question would be who would be next, right? That's why I think what she's on coming home again, like Haksin was very timely. And I can tell that we were because he was banned from his dad. No one could, no one could untie the ban, apart from the king. So what I'm what I'm saying is that you know this is not just about the case of him buying an air ticket and coming back to Bangkok. You know he have to got a, some kind some kind of green light or permission. I mean, okay, might might not be directly from the king, but has to be certain agencies working with the king that that sort of gave him the signal that you can come home. So he came home, uh, and I even thought that, you know, to, to bring in the younger brother, that was sudden. I, I, I think I would like to believe that he thought that, you know, let me go first. And if it's safe, then you could come back. But then, you know, the, the reception was quite phenomenal, right? Uh, of course, all the, all the royalists, young and young and old, they love it. Oh, my God, this is long lost prince. You know, oh, my God, we feel sorry for him. You know, I become so sympathetic toward him. So, uh, yeah, he got such, sort of, you know, like, Ma yok, po yok, you know, supporters. A bit, a bit more, uh, sort of, not sure, even skeptical from the pro-democracy side. I'm running Royalist, Royalist Marketplace, you know, 2.3 million, and I monitor every comment, you know, about him going home. It's mixed, you know. A lot of him just sort of basically saying that, look, no, this is such a show, enough is enough. I don't want Rama 11, you know, no matter how good you try, you know. But, but I think that a part of it sort of, start to open up and say, hmm, this might not be a bad choice, you know, at least better than the other two, you know, <laughs> but if, you know, among, among, among the bad, you know, you know, maybe this could be the, the only one. So I sort of, you know, that there, there, there might be an, an option, option, opportunity for him. I'd like to end that uh, the coming home of Wachele Son, uh, once again, I think to provide an alternative to, uh, to, to, uh, to the Thai monarchy, right? Uh, but it will not be easy uh, because, you know, monarchy in Thailand, just like elsewhere, you know, they're not really completely open to modernity. Even when you talk about the British or the Japanese, you know, uh, monarchy, they are so fiercely conservative. And I think in Thailand, it's even more, right? So to bring home someone who has grown up in the past three decades in the U.S., who has now become so westernized, yeah? And uh, at the same time, have to, you know, sit in this role of this position of, you know, 700 year old, and that you are supposed, you are supposed to sort of inherit, you know, whatever that passed on to you. And at the same time, there's so many challenges ahead, you know, with the competition between the non-elective institution and elective institution. And now the younger generation and the old and diehard royalists, I think what she's on sort of, you know, in the dilemma, which way he's going to go. I can only tell him on Monday, 
at the exhibition that darling if you want to go if you want to save your family progressive is the only way and he nod yes thank you didn't think that a discussion on the Thai election and all, and all the political machinations that followed and essentially did away with the voice and the will of the people could end on an optimistic note, but somehow we made it happen, Bowen. Um, I want to just ask a couple of questions, both on the, the role of the conservatives and the more progressive, particularly the students, right? Um, and the voices, everybody who voted for me forward, who were subsequently disenfranchised. Um, Glenn Robinson, and you gave to a lot of us, you know, when you speak, uh, you know, politics, has written in an article that one of the biggest trends on social media is the hashtag, not my prime minister, right? So the sense that it is illegitimate. Um, and then the question becomes what comes next, right? Two thirds, uh, in one thing, they probably could criticize the blame with, you know, the conservatives. So you said, well, maybe for criticizing and absent, maybe, you know, work out a deal with the elite. But what do you expect to see from the students? How does that constituency? Uh, no. Well, I mean, it's, I mean, they, they went so far as not just to say, uh, hashtag, uh, not my prime minister. They also did something like not my king too. I mean, they went that far. Uh, I mean, Twitter is another thing that we can talk about. It's just, it's just the, the realm of, you know, possibility. Everything is possible in, in Twitter. And that has been the playground, you know, for Thai youth. In fact, uh, I think it's Twitter and TikTok this day, you know, whether you like TikTok or not, but I think TikTok that was sort of, you know, propel, that's a push the, the Mufford party to, 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 to the winning, you know, position. What the kid could do today, I mean, uh, if, you want to be, you know, if I want to be a beauty queen, then I would say, well, we have to wait for the next election and, you know, cast their vote again. And then, you know, just show the will of, of, the, of, the, of the power of the, of the people. I think they will continue to do so. And I think that, you know, given the Thai, Thai politics today, that the only way to go is basically for the voter to continue to vote for the move forward party. If the party is still with us, yeah, in order to show that, you know, this party got, overwhelming support to the point that maybe they no longer need the support from the Senate, right? Yeah, but again, too far from now to talk about what can happen in Thai politics four years. Four days in Thailand, it's just like four years, you know, <laughs> elsewhere. So uh, so that's why, yes, one thing maybe they could hope to expect to, I like to use this word, and I talk to a lot of them, yes, that they, they want to do this because they want to protest so peacefully at the ballot box. There's nothing better than going to the election, right? It's so peaceful. Then why we have to go on the street, you know, and fight and someone get killed? But again, time and again, it proved that this peaceful method has been denied. So is that to say that you don't expect a lot of people? That's what I'm going to say next, because it has been denied. So I think what then, what, what choice is left for them apart from going on the street? But I think that there could be different things going at the same time. Going on the street, that's one thing. Yeah, and I think that, you know, even though um, despite the crackdown, they would, they would still want to go on the street anyway. I think, I think there could be, at least what I have heard, there, there would be some sort of more, how to say, uh, more coordination, more uh, coordinate, coordination, coordinate, coordinating work between uh, the younger generation and the Mufford party not just only working within sort of a political area now, but, but sort of working in order to move society forward, in order to sort of, you know, uh, introducing uh, uh, critical issues so that the youth could become a part of discussion, you know, in public. That, I think that is one way of, you know, political activism for the kid, not necessarily have to rely on the ballot box and also on the, on the, on the street protest alone but you know there's a lot of more there's a lot more thing that the kids and the and the youth movement can work with uh move forward, move forward party on in order to put or bring about uh key or critical uh issue to be discussed you know in in, in the public area that was the 
was the next question that I wanted to ask. Um, my understanding, you know, this unelected Senate that essentially disenfranchised the voters uh, is due for constitutional review over the next year or so. So how is that going to play out? And what does that look like? And is there any possibility that the Senate loses some of its power to? Sure. I really don't know what's going to happen next year, but mm -hmm. I know that the term would come to an end. Uh, well, I mean, looking at the, the, the direction of this government going to, you know, going to, I mean, going toward, uh, you know, uh, going toward befriend, befriending, you know, the pilot or being, you know, friend of the pilot. So maybe what I could expect is that perhaps maybe the role of, of the Senate could remain the same because I don't think the Pertai Party uh, would want to do anything to to stir up what they would want to, to project as a kind of stability for this government. Look, even Thaksin, you know, coming from the other side, can now work so nicely, you know, with the rest of the team, and especially to work, you know, in order to support, you know, the key institution, the, the, the military and the monarchy. So that's why, in other words, what I'm trying to say, Anne-Marie, is that, that we should not expect anything drastic that would allow the shift of, you know, political landscape in Thailand to the benefit of, of the opponent. So more or less, I think Thailand would remain the same. We already heard, you know, as they say, the speech of Seta, you know, self-sufficiency economy, oh my God, at the UN. I mean, we have been talking about that for more than, more than 10 years, 20 years. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and, and yeah, I don't, I don't think, and, and Thaksin is still, you know, under confinement, so. One last question before, um, before I open it up. You said, if I heard you correctly, that there would be some degree of stability with this government. There's been other analyses that kind of argue the opposite, that mm -hmm. this is a very unwieldy um, coalition of 11 parties. It's hard to see how it all hangs together. Mm -hmm. um, you so, see it hanging together? I think it, it could go both ways. I mean, if I, if I happen to mention that a kind of instability, just because I think that right now, the deal was done. That's it. The deal was done. And then once the deal was done, and in this, you know, honeymoon period, then you might expect to see some kind of some kind of stability. But who knows, you know, along the way. I mean, this is typical of coalition government. We have seen this in Thailand in the 1990s. Yeah, when you have like 15, 20 parties coming together, it's very difficult to handle. But but right now, the political context in 2023. And for the next four years, very different from 1990s. Right now, the monarchy has become an official player in Thai politics, unlike in 1990s, working from behind the scene. So each and every party within this government, they know that they have certain obligations to fulfill. And that means to ensure that, you know, the highest institution would be there, would be strengthened, would be secure. So maybe one thing that would allow them to do is to ensure that they have stability. I know I promised to open it up, but one last question, because you keep talking about Puatai and Toxin, mm. and I guess so many of us are wondering, what is Toxin's influence? Does he control the party the way he used to? Because his interest in going back to Thailand was at odds with the interest of the party vis-a-vis -vis the voters and many of its supporters, right? So how do we think about the party versus Toxin? And because it seems like Toxin benefited from the deal and suicide had not. Well, I mean, this could be short. I, I can tell you that these terms, these two terms are in in the exchangeable, right? It can become a substitute for one and for one another. Uh if Bangkok is Thailand, then Thaksin is Pur Thai. There would be no Thaksin in Pur Thai. But there could be no Pur Thai in Thaksin. Is it confusing? Uh, Thaksin basically determines everything. I mean, in my close encounter with him, countless times, when he talk about the party, about you know the, the, ne the next generation in the party, oh my God, it's just all about Thaksin. It's about whom he can trust. It's about dynastic politics, you know. Uh, Seta is exactly, you know, an example of 
whom he trusts. You know, can you believe it that there's so many people who are so capable in p e r t a i Party who have so devoted for the party from day one, who work so much so tirelessly, never offer a chance. s e t a coming from somewhere and just landed, you know, in this position and suddenly become prime minister. So this is the magic of Thaksin, uh, but this is not the politic that the new generation has wanted, right? We, this is the approach is very different from the Mufford Party, because I mean Mufford Party is not basically uh, based on econ- business connection, right? Not based on you know deep political connection that you know you know all diehard you know politician and you bring them together. Mufford Party is very basically very very organic, and I think that you know came across as. You know something that preferable, you know, for the younger generation. I can't say more about m o v e r Party. I t h o u g h t they would think that I'm their supporter. I'm not. <laughs> okay. Um, it is my pleasure to open up the discussion. If you are with us online, please put a question in the chat, and I will try to get to it. Otherwise, uh, comments, questions from those here in the room. We have some mics. Okay, the gentleman over here. Could you just introduce yourself, please? So, I'm a big c o n s e r v a t i v in Thailand. I work with both p a t a i and some of the MPs and move forward. I I would like to have your opinion about this. Um, after the election, I think it became clear that we have two distinct political machines operating in Thailand. It's move forward, uh, which relies on you know like co- uh, effective communication strategy and coalitions with. Movement and civil rights uh, and civil society and all other parties which still rely on the, the power of local political dynasty, which include p e r t h a i right? So if Move Forward Party wants to become a single majority party in the next election, it means that the political machine must become a dominant model in Thai politics. Do you think it's possible, or can we expect that Thailand will have a government formed by a coalition of conservative political dynasty like we have right now for a really long while? Well, I mean, to 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 look into the future, especially you know how successful the Movement Party would become, uh, we also have to think about uh, the, the 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 political reality and political mood. Okay, what I'm trying to say is that the mood right now. Yeah, if you ask them, a lot of people are so disappointed with the with the outcome of the election. So that's why, as I said, if there would be an a, an election tomorrow, you know, you don't have to worry about you know building up this network of movement. They would would all would vote, vote for m o v e f o r party, right? So I hope that that mood that mood would last long enough, you know, until the four until the next four year. If it would last long enough, it would it would be easier for the move move for party to sort of you know extend you know their network, right? Uh, that would come with you know uh by then it would be long year of people discontentment of you know the old machine and they want something new. So I think first thing first, yeah, I hope that you know this political mood would be with would be with us for quite some time. Second one, I think I think this is the that the right direction for the move for move for to go. I mean, at the beginning, I was one of the most uh, the fierce fiercest critics, you know, of the party. You know, I would not, I would never believe that you know they would be able to uh, build up you know branches you know all over the country because they don't have enough money, they don't have enough power. You know, I mean, I have heard that you know they fail in their organization. You know, with inside and 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 this and that. So so I basically would never believe it. But then then. They proved me wrong, you know, with the with the result of the of the election, and I think they have done great work, you know, in going into a uh, sort of you know non non Bangkok you know area in especially in territory of Thaksin, and then and then a, a different strategy of you know in order to try to to try to go there and sell you know populist policy like Thaksin, you know they do they do different thing. I think they go there to sort of you know uh, empowerment. Them, uh, then to make sure that you know whatever they work together, it would be long lasting, would be sustainable, but it's not self sufficiency. Okay, uh, yeah, but and and I think that I I I I try to read the mind of the old r e c h a r d why they change their mind. I think at some point, you know, uh, whatever t a k s i n has promised, it sort of run out of steam. Yeah, and and t a k s i n so much so. Uh, promise, promise so much so about you know better livelihood, 
but better livelihood, better livelihood under Thaksin was never sustainable because Thaksin never dealt with a bigger issue. So based on, in, in other words, Thaksin only deal with, you know, issue on the surface, which would only make people feel good for a little while. But then when Thaksin, you know, became a threat to the elite, when it's time to, to have to be eliminated, then you know that the real problem sort of came up. That real problem is something that the Buddha I never discussed and talked to their constituencies. But I think the, the Mufu Party did it. So good for them. And I hope that they, they would be able to do. And, and, and to answer your question, yes, I think this could be the next, the next shift of the sort of approach in Thai politics in the next four years. Okay, others. Um, Sydney and Linda, you here. Thanks, Sydney Jones from NYU and IPAC. Um, do you see any fissures in the Thai military? And if so, uh, how would you define those fissures? Uh, oh, I wish there is one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, lots of our is basically the, the private you know, regiment of the king, uh, it's just too weak. Too weak to become uh, a, competi a competition for the, for the national army. I know that, you know, in all country, you know, no, but no country would be happy to see different type of army, you know, but, but I don't think in this case, uh, uh, the, the large you know, never pose any threat. So in other words, the nat national army, this is basically disregard. In terms of any other kind of, you know, fragmentation, it's weird enough, you know, I mean, and, and I have changed my mind quite a lot. I thought once I thought that because the crown prince, the king, the, the former crown prince had been, had been, you know, pushed away for so long under Pumipon that he had no role whatsoever in the army. Unlike Pumipon, right, become the head of the army, this and that, you know. Uh, but then there's no role of, of Washington. And I like to think that when he became king at the age of six, late 60, it was too late for him to build this kind of relationship with the army. Yeah, and I know that a lot of army, big army people, they dislike him uh, because Pumipon disliked the son. Then because we love Pumipon and we were, blah, 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 yeah, okay. <laughs> But one thing I forgot, and it's come in my next book, is time for promotion. So there is a chapter uh, written by a uh, Greg Raymond at ANU uh, about the relationship between the military and the army. Excellent, excellent uh, chapter. Me and him, we went to Dantrun to dig up, you know, during which time he was a student there. There was so much so to show that he was so much into mil militarism and it, it had been in him. It had made who he is just because he was, you know, went into uh, done through this and that. And I think with that, it helped him so much in reconnecting with the army. So that's why, you know, people start to call him Marshall King. Mm. Yeah. With, you know, certain uniform, you know, certain haircut, you know, certain certain posture, your oop, something like that. You know, suddenly, you know, people in, in the army, they thought, mm, yeah, this king sort of becoming a role model you know, for the army to an extent. Yeah. So because of that, uh, I still cannot see, you know, major uh, fissure that, 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 could, could, that could have happened. I could be wrong with Sydney because I'm, I'm not really uh, dealt so much into it. Uh, but, but let me put it this way, it's not a matter of my concern at the moment. Even when, even when the Mufo Party brought this up in the parliament and it shook the parliament with the elephant ticket, Right. Basically, this is about the, the, the corruption within the, the police and the army, whom you know, and you get to the top, right? And that upset, you know, people below. That's a good thing for Mufu to do it, to, in order to create, you know, future. And it sort of falls. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Linda, you want to talk about yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Pauline Inshaw. I'm studying sustainability, definitely not self sufficiency at Columbia. Um, so, my question is could you shed some light on the different factions in the palace and the different agencies that help to uphold the uh, monarchy and their different interests? What do what I say come from me, not come from what you on, okay? Uh... <laughs> I use the term progressive royalists 
during the time watch watch it on watch home because there's so much so talking about oh Washington just bought his own ticket you know nobody care I said no 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 this for against my argument that he had to have some kind of commission and when I said that he had to have some kind of commission so that there, there must have been someone in the palace who who had to be progressive come on you know otherwise you know they would not invite him, him in so I used the term progressive and then Ajahn Somsa told me that told me off that nonsense there's no such thing Royal, royalists are royalists there's no such thing called progressive within royalists so that's why I maybe have to amend the term is less conservative but yet, yes, of course, there are different factions in there, right? Uh, as far as I know, so there would be certain certain people who are so close to the king, and I can tell that one one person person is General Apirat Pong Sompong. So this the, who, the, he is someone whom we have to you know monitor closely in the future, because uh, he has been in charge of the, the royal household and be sort of you know uh, number one you know or number two uh, right hand man of, of the king. So yeah, that type of, of you know of palace faction has remained so fiercely conservative because I think they carry the the idea of being an in institution is you have to be conservative. There is no less, there is no compromise. That you know tradition is tradition, and that's why I like to believe or even argue that is it is this faction that might propose Tipangon as the next heir. Because it would be easy for them to control, right? Uh, the next reign, you know, should it be uh, Kipangkon? So, uh, yeah, sometimes, you know, I mean, I mean, not sometimes. I think conservative uh, elites, you know, like to take like like to take control anyway, and like to have uh, weaker people surrounding them. So that's why type of, this is a type of Thai politics as well, right? You know, uh, under the royal hegemony for seven decades, yeah, in which. They would allow certain government to survive or not to survive. You would only survive if you subservient or if you weak enough. So this is they they, they use tact this tactic all along. But I also like to think that there would be a different part of it, which would look into a longer future of the monarchy. Not necessarily open up so much so for any kind of mod modernity, but hey, you know, for the survival, we have to survive, right? Then we have to think longer. I think it could be that type of royal palace that have become associated with Watch Son and then inviting him back to become an alternative. So that's why I don't know how serious, you know, this kind, this kind of conflict or friction between different groups there. Yeah, it could become it could become more serious when they become when when the king become older, right? It could become more serious. It's also very difficult for Watch Son himself. As I said, because he sort of stand, stand at the dilemma, you know, on the one hand, you just want to appeal to, to the younger generation because this is some, this is the group of people who would help with the survival of the monarchy. So you have to come across as being progressive. But at the same time, if you become too progressive, then the conservative would reject you altogether. So you might not be able to come home again, right? <laughs> That's why. Sorry, that I laugh out. So that's why, you know, at the beginning, watch this on giving a, an, an interview, you know. Oh my God, I look through the window on, on my plane and I see Bangkok, Thailand. Oh my God, that is my motherland. That is so, you know, this is something that the conservative people would like to hear, right? They do not, they do not want to hear equality, fairness, yeah. But watch this on this safe door toward the end. At Suwanapum Airport. So I think that was quite cunning of him to come across as, you know, I'm going both sides for the time being. But to answer your question, I don't know when the conflict would come, would arise. Okay, um, I'm going to read a question from uh, the online audience from Eric White, and then we'll go to David Timberman. So the question is, what can we expect in the future from PETA and move forward as the parliamentary political opposition? Um, what will they be doing in the parliament? Well, I mean, they did excellent job, you know, during the youth administration. Uh, whereas, you know, poor Thai just almost did nothing, right? Uh, and and you have to give credit to, uh, I'm gonna say the younger generation, but 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 again, everyone in 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 this party is young anyway. But there's even younger generation. Yeah, you're talking about Rome. You're talking about I think, you know, these people they play, you know, uh, they play prominent role. Uh, uh, in in the previous administration, you know, uh, they 
dare to bring up you know a critical issue to be discussed in the parliament the issue that you have never heard before in your life you know i think for for me you know that was such an achievement so what we could expect from them i think yeah pita sort of you know having this kind of a, a sense of you know leadership to a great extent yeah uh but but it might it might take longer time for a lot of people to warm up with him unlike thanaton you know which is a little bit more look tung meaning that a little bit more down to earth uh, so that you can connect with him so immediately but pertha is a little bit more posh you know coming from harvard this and that but yeah i think he come across well he speak well and and he speak the right thing at the right time for example you know right after the the the, the end of the election on the 14 and the 15 oh my god he came out and talk about burma yeah. policy I mean, this thing that I would never imagine, you know, because foreign policy, which we can talk about it, you know, is never sexy in Thai politics. Nobody care about foreign policy. But Pita went out and said, look, if I lead the next government, I would do one, two, three, four for Myanmar. So I thought that was very impressive. So the, the, the answer is that then I expect a lot from them. And I think they will do a good job exactly because they have been alienated this way. It's time for revenge as they become. And opposition, and I hope they will do well. <clears throat> okay, um, I promised the next question to David, but then I don't want to go back to the foreign policy. Yeah, right. go ahead, David. yeah thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Anne Marie, I, I assumed you were going to ask about foreign policy, but you so I won't ask about that. Um, but that was an interesting ask or is an interesting aspect to move forward. I mean, they're very you know positive approach to foreign policy. Um, but what I want to ask you about Kunpavin is, um, you've you know you've talked about the different instruments used to basically thwart the election um, or the results of the election. Could you talk a little bit more though about kind of the role of legal cases in the judiciary? Um, is there and more broadly, is there any reason to hope, you know, looking forward, that the Thai judiciary is subject to any possible reform? Or is it just purely, should we just view it as an instrument, you know, essentially of the monarchy? Thanks. This is a, this is a saddest story coming out of Thailand. It's a saddest story because in any country, you know, certain, certain institutions could fail, but the, con the country can continue. But when the justice, justice system, justice uh, institution fail, then the whole thing fail. And I think Thailand is failing because of the politicization of the in, of the judiciary in Thailand. So basically, I mean, I don't have to lecture you. That we know that this has been long. It's now become a new normal. And I think even now become an old normal. Uh, that would give, you know, a free pass to the constitutional court, constitutional court to intervene in politics. Anytime it likes, you know, starting from 2008 with Sama, and it had been nonstop with the current situation with Pita and like quite likely with the future of, the move forward party. So you cannot separate the ju judiciary uh, from uh, the old elite, if not from the monarchy. And I think it has been the uh, it has been the what it called what is this word? Uh, when toward the end of toward the end of the of the Pumipon era, right? Pumipon sort of you know stopped serving a role as political referee. But then he delegated, you know, the court to serve, you know, in his role when he's gone. Yeah, because he know that he can't give this role to his son. <laughs> you know, if only his son, you know, has that kind of moral authority and charisma like the dad, then okay, it would be a different story. But of course, we can't, you know, have any faith in, in Washington. If anything, talking about him and legality. In my book, the, the one chapter by David Streckfuss talking about the source of legality of Washington, which is also very interesting. But going back to the, 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 the issue here. So then that exactly because of this role that has been assigned to the judiciary, you know, to sort of being official political referee, but in reality, you're working to protect the interests of your monarchy. It will never change, right? And I think, I think, that's why I say it has become an, an old normal now, which is quite, uh, you know, scary because then people start to see that the dissolution of any party or the disqualif disqualification of Chaw yesterday is bad, but well, we have to accept it. 
foreign policy? What can we expect? I mean, the new foreign minister does have some credentials and economics comes from the diplomatic family, has said some things um, like moving forward about a change in Myanmar policy. Um, what do you expect to see? Well, this, this could be very brief. <laughs> <clears throat> It's, well for five <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's about well, you know, for someone who you know write a book on foreign policy. Uh, uh, you see, I don't know how, how to even begin. I don't think Thailand had had foreign policy for a long, long time, you know, and I dare to make this argument. Uh, I even dare to say that you know our grand foreign policy ended in 2005, and since we don't have anything outstanding, and because of the because of the way in which this party coming into power, that would determine uh, the shape and the future direction of foreign policy as well. In other words, you know, I don't think they have that full legitimacy in coming to power. You know, if only you have full legitimacy to coming into power, then you have time and energy to invest, invest in foreign policy because you don't have to worry about securing recognition and getting legitimacy from key alliance, if you know what I mean. So in other words, I think this government would follow in the footsteps of previous government when the government would become so preoccupied with, uh, you know, seeking alliance in order to get a stamp, you know, from them that this current government is legitimate and will do all it can to maintain this bilateral relationship. And this is also applicable to the case of the Thai-US relation too. I don't think it would go beyond, you know, or it would go out of the box. Let's put me that way. But <laughs> Thai-US relation has, has remained in the box since the Cold War. <laughs> so too. So uh, yeah, in other words, I, I don't think we, we, would, we would start to see anything uh, that would showcase, you know, Thai initiative uh, at the international community, yeah. Uh, I mean, you could you could see something bit and pieces just to just to be uh, uh just just to serve as a kind of symbol that Thailand basically being an active partic participant in in the global affair. But you know, when it comes to key issues like like if you if you talk if you have to talk about human rights and democracy at the international level and i think this day is, is very important yeah it's important to talk to talk about you know war in ukraine talk about you know instability in russia talk about what's going on in china without this basis of you know promoting of democracy and human rights you can't talk about it what else you're going to talk about it when you go to china so that's again leaving uh, leaving me with you know very negative and pessimistic note that Yet this would be an, another episode of Thai diplomacy, which would remain, which would remain so, uh, which would focus so re so mainly on getting recognition of the current government rather than do, doing anything that would bring about, you know, strategic diplomacy from Thailand. Can I just touch you on that a little bit because earlier in the talk, you know, you said that there were constraints on how the government acted towards the protest, right? More sophisticated rubber bullets, et cetera, because you don't want to kill people because then you get criticized, presumably even then by the West, right? Yep. Because China and others are not going to um, interfere in other countries' affairs. And yet what we saw was the old government really legitimating itself vis-a-vis China and other countries with a lot of economic aid, et cetera. So the way in which you legitimate yourself with kind of the West and China, Russia, other countries seems to be different. So are you going to see different ways in which the government plays China, plays the U.S. for that legitimacy? Or how does that work? I would, I, I would, I would, I would put it in the same package. Memory. In the same package, in the sense that exactly because you want the, the, the recognition, then you might have to follow, follow certain international practices. And I think, you know, to deal with protester in a human, human way. So that is the way to go. Especially, you know, uh, you see, this is, this is so typical of Western government and in the context of United States and Europe, you know, and I know them really well because in the past two years, I have done a lot of advocacy, talking to a lot of people from the State Department 
to the point that they do not no longer want to talk to me. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, it's true. And then, you know, uh, with all the all the, the ministry in the Euro- European Union, the, the irony is that so much so that they talk about democracy and human rights. And I'm sure that they have a big question for the current government. But everything goes according to, you know, the Thai constitution and, you know, legal path. They seem to be quite satisfied with it. That's it, yeah. It's the end of the election, yeah. They form the government, give them time to work. The EU and the US would step out and see what we can help. So this had long been a mindset, you know, of European, you know, Europe, Europe, Europe might be a bit better, a little bit better than the United States. But it had long been this type of mindset that, you know, okay, it is not, you know, genocide, you know, or the case of Burma, then we try to stay here. Uh, just enough for us to grab some, you know, economic interest, yeah, and then to talk a little bit on human rights, but we would not want to go further mm-hmm. to, you know, to to basically just basically rupture the whole thing. Uh, I mean, I met them, uh, someone from European Union uh, last late last year. Just that just happened when the European Union just uh, started a uh, resume uh, the negotiation with Thailand after it had long frozen as a result of the coup two thousand fourteen. Oh my God, I scream at them. How could you do it? You know, can you wait for the improvement of human rights situation and use this as a kind of bargaining thing? You know, you know, unless you improve your human rights, then we would be ready to 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 or to resume. You know, FTA negotiation with Thailand. Yeah, I was so disappointed. But but they have their own way of explaining away. They said, well, exactly, Pawin, because we want to continue to engage with the Thai with the Thai authority by not engaging with them, we find difficult to talk about human rights, by resuming, you know, talk like that. So it would sort of open up an, an avenue for them to sort of talk about other things. I said, okay, yeah, right. Then what can I say? Okay, thank you. Um, let's go to the woman here and then over here and then the gentleman. Thank you. Um, my name is Nepal Sadawasi. I'm a community-based urban economic development planner here in New York. Um, Quest, two questions, one about governance now that the elections are over. Um, the other one is about the Deep South. So the first question, so now a period of governance kind of looms up. What do you anticipate kind of a raft of populist policies to shore up support um, in time for the next election? Um, and the second one, what's your analysis of how all of this would affect the situation down in the Deep South? So sorry, the first one you're talking about uh, the populist. Uh, yeah. Do you like? Do you anticipate kind of a bunch of populist policies now to shore up support? And if so, what kinds? Well, I mean, I think I think this has remained the only strategy of the poor Thai party of the poor Thai government. I think the poor Thai think that they did it well in the past. You know, by feeding food and money, right? They they talk about you know digital wallet of ten thousand baht. Uh, you know, uh, cash hand handling this and that. They thought that that. Yeah, somehow they might could pull things, right? And this would sort of save them from the next election. Because when people, a lot of people sort of threaten the Thai party that, you know, you have to pay the price, you know, for the next election. So I think, okay, the next four years, we might we, we might see, you know, police, populist policy like in the past, you know, uh, coming out of this current government. Yeah, but I, I, I can only have to remind them that Thailand in 2023 is so different from 2001. You know, I mean, we the, the changing political landscape, the changing political context, you know, the, the coming up a new generation. I think I did emphasize in this lecture that, you know, what the new generation wants. Uh, I mean, I would never say that bread and butter issue is not important, you know, otherwise I would become a part of the elite. Yeah. So my God, you disregard, you know, this smaller, you know, but 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 impactful issue. No, I would never. But I think at this point in time, it's important, but not it's num- but not number one priority. Not it 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 no longer be a thing that would determine the future of the generation. How could you think about bread and butter and that would, that is my future? No, but they think about yeah. We have to have you know a, 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 an institu- institution that has to be transparent. That had had to be accountable. Yeah, that have to you know spend taxpayer money well. Yeah, that is something I want. Then if you can deal with that. I think better livelihood will come up. So that's why I think it's going to be hard for the poor Thai to prove that, to prove the magic of populism. Second one is very short answer I can't answer because I'm not working on the southern conflict, right? Uh, but just only my own 
humble observation is that uh, the the coming of the Setha government might not be good news for the South. Yeah, given uh, what Thaksin did, you know, in 2004, mm -hmm. something that they would never forget. Yeah. And uh, there would never be any sort of sincere apology. A sincere apology is one thing, but to fix the problem, you know, we had been unable to fix it. Yeah. Uh, and secondly, we're talking about uh, the convert of the South to Orange. And exactly because, you know, they don't get the government they wanted, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't think it can lead to any peaceful solution during the next four years. But again, this is my humble observation. I might not be the best person to answer. Okay, we'll go over here. Oh. Here. My name is Therese Coet. And I'm working with Thomasat University. And I have a, just to play on her question, I think that a lot of people in the Moving Forward Party, the senators, have been very outspoken about what's happening in the Deep South. And there's been other pressure that... Do you think... I think there's a big hope, or do you see some hope in that pushing some of the politics or the government discussions, or are they just going to be quieted? Yeah, I have some hope, yeah. <clears throat> In fact, uh, the 2020 uh, youth-led protest gave me a lot of hope. If you can talk about the elephant in, in, in the room, then I think you can talk about the issue. Yeah. So I think, I think for, Thai, for Thai people, uh, the issue of the monarchy is just basically the, the epitome of you know all things that had gone wrong. So if you are willing to deal with it, despite the less majestic law, I think big issue like the starting conflict, you know, should come up. Yeah. And I think I think we have any other issue, uh, not just the, the southern conflict as well. Uh we're we'll talking about the uh, other social issue, uh the the problem with you know the LGBT, LGBT community, you know, uh the same sex marriage still hang in the balance. This thing for a lot of people has been such a big issue as well. It only be possible, you know, only recently that 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 I think the, the movement sort of once again opened the door for all these, you know, critical issue that had all been swept underneath the carpet to come out. So again, I'm not be the, the best person to, to answer that question too, but I think there is a possibility just because of the of the the, the new environment, political environment that might allow it. To, to come up to self to the surface more easily. Okay, and I think um, this will probably have to be our last question. Go ahead. Last two questions. So. <laughs> okay. So teach like freelance students. Um, and correct me if, if I'm not at point. Um, you said in the past that you were followed, and you know who ordered the operation. My first question is, do you feel safe now? And second question is, how did you figure out who ordered that operation? Oh, this is so out of the, <laughs> out of the, the lecture scope. So, but I'm happy to say, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> since day one, since this, since this thing happened, it's happened in 2019. In case nobody understands. Yeah, why don't you? Yeah, yeah. The, the context. Yeah. Uh, in uh in the hot summer in Kyoto, uh in July, uh 4:45 in the morning, someone broke into my apartment in Kyoto, walked his way into my uh, apartment. Uh, sorry, my bedroom. And, and it's unlocked, you know, it's, it's sort of sliding door. You know, this person, you know, sort of opened the door, attacked me with chemical spray and ran off. That's it. And gone with the wind. So, my God, you know, to, to be waking up, you know, in the, middle, in the middle of the night and then saw someone at the, at the foot of the bed, it was very scary. I knew immediately that, yeah, it's a palace. You know, it, it, it's in my head. It, it cannot be any art any other answer but the palace. And I, I know it, you know, because I long, I had long been a thorn, you know, uh, to, to the palace. And I think, you know, looking back, there could be some, there could be some circumstances that, that seemed to explain it, yeah? Because that was about two or three months after the coronation. And it, it happened that during the coronation, there was news lead in the German newspaper of the house arrest of his former wife. Now, I happen to be the first person to talk about that issue some years before that. But I can swear to God that I did not leave that thing to the German paper, even though I have those photos. Because to me, I think it's not the right time yet. I might do it, but it's not the right time. Someone else seems stole the alarm like, damn. <laughs> but then it become me, because I think that the palace, the palace thought that I was the one who, who co-opted with the media in order to humiliate the king 
on that important day. So this is only my own my own assumption. It might not be true though, but what I know for sure is that it has been the palace. Okay, thing has gone quiet. And I, I was very upset, you know, in dealing with the, with the Japanese police. Again, it's so difficult to explain to you my experience in working with the Japanese police. It's just, oh my God, out of this world. You know, I'm so frustrated that they, they would not tell me anything. So they kept me in, in the dark. Not only that, that I have no information to, to try to explain myself. You know, some people in Thailand, some old drunken journalists, you know, accused me of making up the story. That is one thing that you know I I I anger, I ang I was angry the most you know to accuse me of making up making up story for what I have enough lamb life you know I don't need any more lamb life so it had taken me for two years in order to sort of you know when things sort of unraveling you know eventually one day the police called me up and said look the 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 the, the prosecutor wanted to see you I thought why the prosecutor wanted to see me then. They brought up, you know, the, the file this big, said, look, good news. I arrest, we arrested the man, right? And he confessed. He's a Japanese guy. He confessed. He said that he was hired, but he did not tell the whole truth. He said, I was hired by Senpai. Senpai meaning sort of older brother. And I, I, I admit that I, I did not know Pavin. So this is not about personal thing. Yeah, I was hired to do so. And that person, you know, threatened me that if I would not do it, then then I would be in trouble. So I have to do what I have to do. That's all. So now we know that there's someone, that's, that's the culprit and also someone who order. Yeah. So yeah, okay, done. Uh, the guy was jailed. The, the Japanese police continue with the investigation of who, you know, order the, the attack. It's going to be a long, long, long story from here because it's going to be traced back a long way. Now, uh, feeling safe or, or not, I'm not sure because I'm not the only person who has been attacked. Aside from those who live in Laos and Cambodia. So they were they were more and more unfortunate than me that they were killed, they were falsely you know, disappeared or abducted, you know, and I fell for them. I thought that, you know, uh, living in Japan was safe. Again, no longer the case. I have a, a fellow refugee in Paris. Yeah, she was attacked. And then, as a long story, but it seemed to start off coming from the same jigsaw. Yeah. So in other words, you know, we are no longer, no longer safe. But, you know, my life has to continue. So I have to, you know, live my life, you know, but I have to be a little bit vigilant. That's all. Thank you for the question. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's 5.30. I think you will agree with me that we have had an extremely interesting and very fun and uh, informative discussion. So please join me in thanking Poen. Yes. Just, just a minute about my upcoming book. Uh, please help me give lesson to the Thai authority by ordering more and more. This book is uh, once again titled Rama X, uh, the Thai monarchy under uh, King Vashalongkorn. It will be released this winter by Yale Southeast Asia Studies. Uh, I'm edited the book and there's sort of 10 chapters, all aspects of Rama the 10, very critical aspect of it. So... Uh, they banned this book and even announced it in Royal Cassette, right? Whoever have this book in possession would be jailed, uh, I think three years, and would be fined 30,000 baht. Uh, even they have seen, even before they have seen the final manuscript, I, have, I, 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 can, I can attest that even the contributor have not seen the final manuscript. So only me and, and Yale, so no way that they have seen it, right? So basically, they banned it because of me and because of the cover of the book. So this is another thing that I hope you go and Google the cover. I leave it as a secret, generally. But you have to go, it's, it's, it's a bomb. So it's the, the cover itself is a bomb. And now I feel for the designer. So, <laughs> oh my God. Then, then the, lastly, lastly, they banned the book. They announced it in, in Royal Cassette. But they, there was a mistake in, in, in the title. So they dropped the term under. So it become Rama X, Thai Monarchy, King Washington. Can you believe it? It has to come out with the second announcement, second ban of the book to ensure that, you know, the, when the people have the book, you know, they would be completely banned. But this go to show that how stupid, you know, and absurd priority they have to announce twice, you know, the ban of my book. But thank God it helped with myself. <laughs> um, maybe one other um, 
publicity announcement, which is that there is an exhibition oh, yeah. on campus uh, that Pollen opened. It runs for the through what next weekend? Yeah. Just one last week. Sorry, I mean even even bigger than the band. I'm so sorry. I mean, God. Yes, I have my own exhibition right here at camp uh, at Columbia. So at a Leroy Newman Gallery. So this has been my other hat of being activist. You know, I formed this 112 Watch project and have been doing so for two years, uh, going out and about talking to different people. I thought that maybe it's time to express it through arts. So I came up with interview, interviewing 25 victims of 112, one of them myself. Uh, uh, one, two, yep. Yeah, but I try to portray him as not just fact, but but a kind of human story. So I ask every one of them, you know, how you become, why, how, why have you been charged? What do you think about the law? You know, how it affected your life? You know, what you want the Thai society to help you and also the international community as well. And some, some of the stories are so heartfelt. So yeah, yeah, I'm so grateful with Columbia that allow allow me to to showcase this exhibition, which started on Monday and it will last until the 25th. Yes, of during office hour and and during during exhibition, then there would be uh the 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 the, the video the playing of the video of the interview of some of the interview we as well. Thank you very much. It Leroy Newman Garali. Within, it's sort of almost at the front door, at the main gate. It's sort of tucked away. Yeah, you go and ask the best exhibition. Where well, I can see the best exhibition, they'll take you there. All right, thank you all. Thanks, Howard.